Hello everybody, welcome to Spider-Man Month, and we're going to be basically doing a series of videos for about a week or so, and it's going to be an entire retrospective on Spider-Man, its series, its impact on me and pop culture, and then I'm going to give you guys a review at the end of the new movie, Amazing Spider-Man. But for now, I'm going to give you guys a review of the first three Spider-Man movies, starting with the very first one. So, let's get started. Now, Spider-Man 2002, which is what it's being called nowadays because of the reboot. At the time, it was a risk. Comic book movies were basically dead on arrival. The last, like, actual good comic book movie was X-Men. And, you know, that kind of kicked off the whole, like, renaissance for comic book movies, in my opinion. You know, movies like Blade and x-men had come out but before that i mean you had movies like batman and robin which actually got me into batman ironically enough and you know the last superman movie was back in the 80s and that one flopped so batman and superman were basically no longer in theaters and basically it was only marvel doing uh comic book movies until dc got back into it again and X-Men, I thought they pulled it off pretty good, but with Spider-Man, they took it to new grounds. At the time, it was considered one of the greatest comic book movies of all time, next to the original Richard Donner Superman and to Burton's original Batman movies. The plot for the movie, it's kind of, it sort of deviates a little bit from the original comic books, which which I like when they're doing in the new Amazing Spider-Man movie. What Sam Raimi did, Sam Raimi was more of a fan of the original source material, which is why he didn't want to do Venom and Spider-Man 3, but like I said, we'll get to that one later on. So the love interest for this movie is Mary Jane, and Sam Raimi tries to focus that, which kind of sort of worked but at the same time like i kind of like a little bit too the romance just wasn't really the center point so getting back to the main plot so peter parker basically lives in queens new york with his uncle ben aunt may and and his friend harry osborne and basically go to high school together you know peter's like the nerd and everything you know nothing goes his way and then he gets bit by the spider Right before that, we're introduced to Dr. Norman Osborn, played by Willem Dafoe, who's trying to create new genetically uh, modified, basically, serum for the U.S. Army. Unfortunately, his plan doesn't go so well, and he ends up testing it on himself because the U.S. Army was basically unimpressed by the technology, and, he, and his whole company, which is called Oscorp, was going to get canned. His whole company was going to go out of business. So he tests it on himself, he goes mad, and he becomes the Green Goblin. After that, we come with Peter Parker and his struggles to basically, well, basically cope in with high school and everything. You know, I mean, his parents are not around, his parents are dead and everything. He lives with his uncle and aunt, and he basically has to cope with life and everything, which, in my opinion, which made a lot of people, you know, realize that, hey, this, this guy is like, I can relate to this guy, you know? So in order to press Mary Jane, Spider-Man goes, he basically goes out to, like, a wrestling match after he gets bit by the spider on that field trip. He wants to win at least $3,000 to go to in order to buy a sports car in order to impress her with an awesome cameo by uh, Bruce Campbell, by the way. And so he fights Bonesaw, played by Randy Savage, which I love that part. Unfortunately, he only Peter only gets about $100 which is about a third of the money because he knocked out Bonesaw in less than the three minutes, which I'll never understand that. And then right after Peter leaves, a thief comes in, try takes his money. Peter doesn't stop him because he feels like he got cheated. And because of that, because of that one little consequence, his uncle ends up getting shot. Peter basically feels regretful for the rest of the movie and the sequels because he could not stop that you know it was his own fault that he let the robber escape and he suffered the consequences because of that so a little bit right after that Norman Osborn he's still crazy as the Green Goblin 
he's going around he's at he's basically at like a thanksgiving i would say parade and then he comes out with his get up and then he basically kills the people who tried to get to shut him down and everything so anyway spider-man comes to save the day green goblin tries to recruit spider-man to join however spider-man does not join him so basically they're enemies for the rest of the movie then after that he he later finds out that peter is spider-man so he kidnaps Aunt May, basically almost kills her and everything. Kidnaps Mary Jane, which is which will be a recurring theme for the rest of the trilogy. And then some in a pretty damn epic uh final fight and everything. He ends up killing Norman Osborne. However, it was only it was his fault because he's the one that like activated the glider and he just dodged it and then it just penetrates him. So I knew Harry finds out what had happened because he saw Spider-Man right next to that father. He tries to kill him, and now for the rest of the series, Harry's mad with revenge. Peter doesn't know what to do. Mary Jane thinks he loves, she loves Peter. Peter takes her, uh, basically turns her away, and then he goes off as Spider-Man for the rest of the movie. All right, let's talk about the good parts of the movie. First off, it looks visually stunning. It looks amazing. That costume. It just looks so real. You can really tell that that is Spider-Man going around saving the day. Another good part is some of the side characters. In movies, side characters, they're either the bane of your existence or they're just unforgettable. In this movie, J. Jonah Jameson is amazing. The side characters are really, really good. Harry Osborn, James Franco, he plays amazingly as Peter's basically best friend. And he basically plays a lackey to his father because all Harry wanted to do was get more attention from his father. However, his father, I believe, cared more about Peter and basically his. And then finally you had Aunt May, which, you know, pretty good and everything. You know, she gave some pretty good speeches and everything to Peter. And then, of course, there's that famous Great Power Comes Great Responsibility line that came out of Uncle Ben, who was also played amazingly, played by the late Cliff Robertson. Another good thing about the movie is the dialogue. While a lot of people call it cheesy nowadays, it actually is kind of funny. I mean, when, Sp <laughs> when Spider-Man cracks out jokes, he's funny. Like, he really is, like, hilarious. Alright, now we get to the bad parts. There's a few bad parts in this movie, I would have to say. First of all, while the visuals are good, the props can be another thing, especially with the design choices. I know everybody has made fun of the Power Ranger suit that the Green Goblin wears and everything, and yeah, as a kid, I always thought the suit looked really, really weird. Like, basically, he's just, he has a power-up suit. I mean, it honestly looked ridiculous. It was basically a power suit with, like, a glider. Another thing that a lot of people complained about was, was basically the multiple personality disorder that the Green Goblin had. But, you know, I thought that was pretty good, you know? It kept audiences on their toes. Like, oh, is this, is this the good? good Green Goblin, you know, is this Norman Osborn being normal, or is this the real Green Goblin, is this him taking over, is he gonna, like, kill someone out of nowhere, you know, they actually, it kept the audiences on their toes and everything, however, another bad part with the movie, as much as I loved the side characters, I just, I just did not care for Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane. I'm sorry. It, it just wasn't mem memorable in my opinion. And in the sequels, I think that was one of the main problems that Raimi had. He tried to push this relationship and it just wasn't convincing for me in my opinion. So now we come to the impact of the movie. And of course, when Spider-Man came out, it was a huge success. Tobey Maguire got huge recognition for his portrayal of Peter Parker and Spider-Man, which, you know, he deserves. At that time, before The Dark Knight came out and dethroned it, it was the top grossing superhero movie of all time, with over $400 million in the US alone, 800, about $800 million worldwide and everything. Another legacy behind it is that it pushed, it pushed for more creative 
movies, you know, for comic book heroes. Because again, besides like X-Men and Blade, there was no other like, good superhero movie that had come out at all for the past decade and a half. You know, Batman and Robin was terrible. Superman 4 came out in the 80s and that was terrible. And Spider-Man, the movie, was actually in development hell. That's basically a term where it gets, it's in development, but it's just not there. Like, there's, there may be creative differences, there may be production issues, there may be any kinds of issues. Spider-Man, the movie, was originally conceived as being directed by James Cameron and he actually made a script on it. That script would be later rewritten a little bit with a little bit of tweaks in the new in the 2002 movie. Overall I thought the dialogue was alright and everything for the movie. A lot of people nowadays they call it campy and I have to admit it is kinda campy and all the visuals are good and everything you know some of the props were kinda awkward. So anywho stick out Wow, stick out. <laughs> Funny pun there. I'm stupid. No, I'm lame. Anywho, stick around for uh, my review of Spider-Man 2.